Funding for the Our Town podcast is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota and the members of KSMQ Public Television. Thank you. KSMQ Public Television Show. I'm your host, Danielle Teal. Very excited because we have the elections coming up and we have two incredible guests that we're delighted to have share information about what's to come. Mark Krupski, Director of Olmstead County Property Records and Licensing is here, as well as Katie Smith, the Election Manager. Welcome you two. Thank well, you. Thank you for having us. <laughs> now, this is the first time we've had two people on the show. So this is going to be really interesting to see how the Zoom podcast interview goes. Um, so the first thing I want to ask is, how did you become a part of the Olmstead County Property Records and Licensing? Maybe, Mark, you can start first, and then Katie can follow up with that. Well, sure. Uh, well, I've been with Olmstead County since 1990, and uh, we've actually been known as a department of property records and licensing since uh, 2000. Prior to that, uh, there were separate departments, separate assessor, recorder, auditor, treasurer. And through the 90s, uh, three of the four were elected positions and they became appointed, uh, combined, and then combined once again, and we became known as property records and licensing. My original background was in appraisal and I worked in the assessor's office, and, but I was also there for a lot of these uh, changes as we became a land records department, uh, the idea at the county was to become a one-stop shop for services for many things, real estate, but also, as you uh, are well aware, we do elections and, and, and other services. We do driver's license, uh, passports, and death and mar uh, birth certificates and marriages. Well, these are definitely important things that people need in the community, so I'm sure you're pretty busy in that regard. And one of, the, one of the biggest focuses that we wanted to highlight today is the elections. Um, you know, there's a lot going on surrounding that, especially with the pandemic and some challenges uh, in adapting to that. So Katie, can you speak to your involvement? And uh, we'll, we'll dive more into that as well. Sure, yeah, I actually joined the election staff here at Olmstead County just last August. Prior to that, I worked for about 12 years in 911 emergency dispatch. And I was really just drawn to joining the elections department because it's just so unique and there are definitely some things that led from my previous career to this one, such as all of the customer service involvement, as well as the data entry and clerical side of things really attracted me to get to work within elections. And uh, we're definitely ramping up for an interesting year of absentee voting and I'm really looking forward to diving into this conversation with you. That's perfect. So, so that we can give some framing around this, can you, either of you, um, explain how the presidential elections normally work for Minnesota um, and, and then the primary elections? Well, the, uh, uh, the process of uh, not just presidential, but any, uh, whether it's uh, a midterm or a, a general election, as we call it this year, general election year, presidential, uh, starts with the uh, primary. Uh, this year was something unique. We had a presidential primary that we haven't had before, so that's uh, has since been completed, and now we're ready to start tomorrow absentee voting for the primary, which is August 11th, and and so there's 45 days of uh, absentee voting, and then the 46th day is uh, actually the election day on August 11th, and things seem to ramp up uh, and get closer to that date. But this year we did do something different than we've, uh, uh, that we haven't done before. And that is we've mailed out absentee ballot applications to uh, all the Olmstead County registered voters. And the reason for this is simply to uh, reduce the risk of COVID-19. Uh, if people are voting by mail, uh, then they don't have the need to get together uh, in person and, and certain 
people uh, obviously uh, autoimmune disorders and so forth are more susceptible and at higher risk. So this gives a, uh, a wonderful option for folks to uh, you know, mitigate that risk. It doesn't mean that we don't do everything else that we're uh, that we usually do. They'll still be voting on election day. We'll be setting up polling sites, and we'll still have in-person absentee voting. That's really that's really incredible. It's the first time um, mailed absentee ballots get sent out, huh? And what was that? What did that process look like for you, Katie? I mean, was that a lot of heavy lifting to make that happen? Yeah, getting out that initial mailer, we've got about 95,000 registered voters within Olmstead County that we sent that initial mailer out to. We wanted to let everyone know that our absentee office, our elections office, actually moved locations. So we're now at the 2122 Campus Drive location here in Rochester. And with that, we just had a lot of people really interested in voting absentee this time. We were getting a lot of phone calls and a lot of questions about what does that absentee process kind of look like. Uh, so we wanted to provide people just with some more information and with that form that the, they can fill out to request a ballot so that they have that available to them. Uh, nothing has changed like Mark had kind of indicated. You can still vote in any of the ways you've always voted in the state of Minnesota, uh, but there are options to vote absentee. You can vote with us here at the office in person. You can have it mailed to you at home and then drop it off to us here at the office in person, or you can receive it by mail at home and then return it via the US Postal Mail to us. Uh, so we wanted to provide everyone with all of those different unique options that exist for voting absentee. Okay, because I know that this question is out there and people that are listening are going to wonder, how do we ensure that that it's a, it's a credible um, vote that that there's you know um, some verification behind it. Sure, I can speak to that. Every ballot that is returned to us, whether it's dropped off or whether we receive it in the mail, goes through a process called ballot boarding, where we ensure that the envelope it's returned in that the person has signed hasn't been altered, that the person who it was sent to is the person who returned it. We verify that they've provided the correct identification number that's required on there. So there's a lot of checks and balances going on in the background that just ensure that integrity of our election. I'm gonna have to look for this envelope. It got sent out, like, when did it get sent out? <laughs> we did, we sent that mailer a couple of weeks ago. And then the envelope that I'm speaking of though, that you would get that with your ballot to return your ballot inside of it. Okay, got it. Well, I'm gonna have to do some digging to take a look at that. What does the ballot look like for citizens in Olmstead County? You know, what's all on, what is all going to be on there? Go ahead, Katie. Sure. <laughs> so, the ballot for August is a presidential primary ballot. It depends on which ward and precinct that you reside in. If you have anyone who is, for instance, up for election for one of the county races that went to a primary, you might see one of the um, county positions on your ballot. If you live within the city of Rochester, you'll have at least one, if not two, of the city council races to vote on on that ballot. And then there's a U.S. Senate seat that went to a primary ballot as well. The ballot itself this time is a little bit unique because it is a primary ballot, so it's double-sided. And there's partisan races, that's that U.S. Senate race. And you can only vote within one column, within one party for that. But you can make, um, make selections on any of those county and city races on there. Okay, that's good clarification. And can, some, can someone go online and find an exact example ballot? Yes, so I would really encourage everyone to get familiar with mnvotes.org. So mn, like Minnesota, votes, plural, dot org. That's um, linked directly to the Secretary of State and you can do a lot of things on there. You can see your sample ballot. You can find out what your polling place is. You can register to vote. You can apply online to receive an absentee ballot application. All of those things can be done electronically just using that one link. Well, that's what my next question is. How easy is it for people to, vote, uh, to register to vote? And can people um, who haven't registered to vote still get this absentee ballot? 
Yes, you can register to vote online or in person. You can request your absentee ballot online or in person with us. You can call us if you don't have any internet and we can mail it to you in the mail and you can mail it back to us. Um, certainly any of those processes work. And don't worry if you already requested an absentee ballot application and you're not yet registered. That's perfectly acceptable. We'll just send you one extra sheet of paper, which is a voter registration application as part of your packet. Now, I assume that there's going to be some metrics gathered in the response rate of these absentee uh, ballots that get mailed. Have you have you seen a lot uh, a lot of them returned thus far? Uh, actually, we have. We've seen quite a bit. Katie can give you some exact numbers. I believe we're up to sending out uh, fourteen to fifteen thousand uh, ballots thus far. But uh, one thing I want to kind of just backtrack on a little because I think it's so important to uh, education for the voters and uh, instructive is the, uh, as Katie indicated, it's a two sided ballot for the primary and the partisan side of the by party for Senate and so forth. Uh, to make sure your ballot, uh, all your votes count, you can't cross party lines. You must select a party when you're voting. Uh, and so you must uh, read the instructions carefully on that so that uh, that because you don't want to you know make a decision in one and then another and then have your votes uh, canceled out. Uh, so that's just a, another reminder there. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would uh, just mention uh, regarding that voter registration, Minnesota is a same day registration state. So that's really great because uh, it, it uh, gives voters the opportunity to register as late as uh, the election day itself, uh, provided they have the correct documentations that show uh, that they are who they are. And uh, so identification plus something that indicates that they live at the location that they're at. Uh, the last thing I wanted to add uh, regarding the timing of looking up your, your polling location, right now due to COVID-19, uh, the polling sites do not need to be determined until July 1st. In a typical election year, a non-COVID pandemic year, the, uh, we have all the polling sites are determined by Jan December 31st of the prior year. So that's a little different. And the reason for that is some of our polling locations in Rochester, let's say, like Sherwood, uh, that happens to have a population of folks that are determined by the CDC to be you know, more susceptible, more vulnerable to COVID-19. So I would be pretty sure that that one's going to change. So uh, I would wait uh, until a little bit later in July to go and, and actually find your polling site because some of them, especially in the city of Rochester, some will be changing. Yeah, that's a good segue into my next question. How's that gonna look with COVID-19 and CDC guidelines? you know, with social distancing, perhaps ma is masking gonna be required? How are these poll locations going to carry that out? Well, uh, I'll start and then Katie, uh, you know, you can pick it up where I leave off, but uh, we, we're not able to require, you know, insist that the public uh, don't, you know, wear a mask or not wear a mask. We certainly do recommend it if you decide to vote in person. We have at our office, uh, Katie and the team have put these footprints down. Uh, so you know, six feet apart so people can distance when they're in line. Uh, we've purchased uh, over 200 uh, plexiglass shields uh, that we will that we'll use at our office, but we'll also distribute to, uh, we have upwards of 74 polling sites on election day. So we wanna make sure that uh, we protect our election workers and the public and, and there are a lot of other things with hand sanitizer and uh, we have pens that uh, we're okay if people take them, we buy these inexpensive pens. So we're doing lots of things like that. And I'm sure you can uh, add to this list, Katie, because you're right there with the hands on. Will there be stickers, the sticker? Yes. <laughs> That's the best part. It is, it's everyone's favorite part of voting. There'll be self-service this time though. So no one actually handing it to you or, or anything like that. You'll pick one up off of a table. But Mark at home, a lot of the things that we're doing is just following those guidelines from the state or from the CDC, ensuring that we purchased those shields, um, ensuring we have hand sanitizer available, 
um, marking off the six foot social distancing requirements. We're recommending people to wear masks, but like Mark said, we're not gonna, it's not gonna be a requirement. As far as from our absentee standpoint, all of those mailers that we sent out with that absentee application, even for people that wanna come in and vote absentee with us in person in our office, if they fill those out and bring them in already filled out, it reduces the amount of time that people have to spend waiting in line or spend here in our office setting. Uh, so that was one other thing that we had done absentee wise to kind of reduce our lines and try to prevent any spread of, of COVID-19. Do you think this process of the Millen uh, absentee ballots is the new normal, that this will happen again, that you will preemptively send out these absentee ballots? Well, I, I'll take this one. <laughs> uh, at, uh, no excuse absentee voting was passed in 2014. And what that has resulted in, uh, basically the law was kind of passed really for convenience and also to have a law that kind of uh, mirrors what people are actually doing. Uh, when Let's say somebody voted uh, absentee prior to that, we certainly got to say, are you sure you're going to be out of town or we're going to check on that or how do you know you're going to be sick in two weeks, you know? So we, we, there was none of that verification and people just liked the convenience of it. So uh, the, the legislature passed that law. And now what we've seen is the, without COVID-19, we saw uh, absentee voting uh, go from say uh, 10% in 2008 on a presidential year to in 2018 uh, across Olmstead County, it was over 25% oh, wow. for any pandemic. Now for the 2020 election, we were projecting about 33% of the votes will be cast by absentee because one, the convenience, and uh, you know, if you're working or whatever it is, uh, or you, you know, you want to just make sure you can get it done at a time that works with you. We, we all live such busy lives. Well, now you put COVID nineteen on top of this, and our projections are fifty percent, and uh, and that may be low. So we're really uh, preparing for uh, you know our workload uh, with the absentee vote is is increased dramatically because we process all those. We do that ballot. Board. So that's a big endeavor uh, for once it comes time to, to start opening those. And the legislature this year passed uh, a measure that allows us to begin opening two weeks before the election day, prior to that was one week. And the reason they did that is just the sheer volume that they anticipate we'll have. So let's say we have 50,000 envelopes open. It's a pretty uh, daunting task to uh, sort and, and process all the ballots at that point. So uh, we're gearing up resource-wise with staff and so forth to, to meet that demand. Yeah, it sounds like it would be all hands on deck. Katie, you ready for that? Yeah, we are. We've got a lot of provisional extra staff that we've added on. We're drawing from some of the other county offices. We've done a lot of training and we're just really excited for it. I know we've already added up some numbers just for the people that like numbers. Mm -hmm processed and data entered and getting ready to send out the door 15,472 absentee ballots. Wow. That's incredible. And, and here's, a, here's a comparison for you. So uh, if we compare that to past, past years, now here it is only, I mean, it's not. Uh, Mark, you cut out. Well, I think Mark cut out, but I can provide a little bit of data for you until he gets back. Um, it started yet. It's, it's June 25th, and this is a primary. Oh, and, Mark. Uh, we show and, Mark. And the general election. <laughs> yes. Mark, you cut out like. Am I back? Yeah, you're back. It was like a chunk of it we missed, but that's okay. Do you want to recap right. quickly uh, what you were going to say, or Katie can chat a little bit while your uh, Wi-Fi or whatever it is gets all sorted out. Sure, uh, I'll do my best here. And uh, uh, the point I was making is we're at both the 16 and 18 general elections. We had about 17,000. Do you wanna fill in the blanks there, Katie? Sure, I, I think the number- 500, so that's- 
<laughs> All good. We're not going to hold you to whatever came out of that, Mark. Katie's going to go ahead and fill the blanks there. Yeah, I believe Mark's um, numbers, I, I don't have them in front of me. Oh, that's okay. In total for the general election in 2018, I believe we did about 17,000, and that's the entire absentee process. And we're at 15,000 now, and technically absentee starts tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., so we're well above trend. Uh, comparably for the presidential nomination primary, we did just over 5,000 absentee. Our initial mailing was 500 ballots, and this time we're at, at 15,000. So that's just some comparable numbers equations there for everybody that likes numbers. Yeah, that's a great comparison. Wow. Um, do you think that, that uh, there's going to be online features at some point with voting? The state of Minnesota um, is very, very good at checks and balances and always like, having backups and making sure that data is accurate and protected. Under our state statute, we have to have paper copy, um, that's paper ballots. All right, okay, so let's focus on some of the demographics. Um, you know, how is Olmstead County working to help the most vulnerable population vote you know, elderly people, persons of color, people without internet access, other minorities, you know, is, is the accessibility piece, is there a, a strategy for that? Yeah. Well, yes. Am I there? You're, you're finally here, but it's still freeze frame for you, Mark. Oh, I'll let Katie, go ahead, Katie. Sure. We have a lot of different options, like I had mentioned before with our absentee process to make everything more accessible to all of the citizens within our county. So we do have that option to vote by mail. We do have that option to receive your ballot and return it back to us. We do have the in-person absentee for an extended length of time. We have an option called curbside voting, where if someone's unable to get out of their vehicle, but they would prefer to come to the polling site or to our absentee office, we can actually send two, two of our staff out to assist them at their car through the voting process and then bring the ballot back inside on their behalf. Now, I know that during the school year, kids used to be able to vote and do those things and it's the summertime. Is there any in engagement with, with children and, and them learning the election process? As far as us doing outreach to... Outreach or just getting their involvement to some capacity or... There is some options for um, high school students to serve as student trainee judges actually in the polling place on election day. There's certain tasks that they wouldn't be asked to perform, but that's certainly something that if you have a child who's older and meets some of those requirements, and you can look on mnvotes.org for some more specifics if you're interested, that you might reach out to your local city clerk or your local municipality and let them know that you have that sort of an interest. Um, obviously, with the schools being closed, we're not going around doing anything as far as civics classes or anything right at this time. What about election judges? Do you have enough? And if people are interested, can they volunteer and where? Yeah, absolutely. We're always looking for more election judges. Um, depending on which city or municipality you're in, that's dependent on who you're going to reach out to. At a county level, uh, we don't hire on the election judges, we do all of the training. So you're going to want to reach out to your city clerk or your township clerk and let them know that you're interested in participating in that process. And what is, what is involved in an election judge? Can you ex explain that a little bit more for people that are learning this new, this process that could be the first time voter or yeah, so the election judges, those are typically the people that you encounter within the polling place if you've ever voted on election day. So it's going to be the person who's greeting you when you're coming in and letting you know what forms of identification you would need if you need to register or where to wait in line or the person who's assisting you with getting registered or checking in or that person who's giving you your ballot to vote or providing you with the directions or instructions or handing out those I voted stickers that everybody loves. I really love those stickers. <laughs> so proud, you know, when you, when you finish voting, it's like, I did it. Um, what do you foresee for election turnout in Minnesota and, and across the country? Are there predictions? And, and then how do you think that absentee ballots will affect the turnaround for the election results? 
I don't know. Mark back. Well, you, you know, we're that. not really great at predictions, but uh, I, it, for this election year, I think we're going to have a pretty good turnout for the primary. Uh, 16 primary, we had a very small turnout, I think it was like 5 6%, but I'm going to guess that we'll have uh, 50% at least, and maybe more. And I think just by sending out the absentee ballot application, those numbers will be up. But the general election, I'm going to say we're going to be close to 90% turnout. I mean, I'm not even involved, and in, and I think so too. <laughs> just, just from just, you know, social interactions, what you see, you know, conversations and, and feedback. People are very interested and in, in invested in this election. Is there anything else that you two want to share about um, uh, about the the primary and, and anything, any details and services provided? The only thing I would add is that. Uh, we are, uh, you know, making uh, backup plans uh, if we don't have enough election judges. And as Katie mentioned, they're hired by the municipality or the townships, the clerks uh, hire the election judges. We train them, but we'll have a good indication of how many election judge are, are going to be in the pool uh, once we start getting through the training. The training is all online. Uh, and so uh, if we see that uh, it's not uh, coming the numbers that we think are adequate, then uh, we, uh, we, we may uh, try to uh, uh, hire county staff and city staff to work that day to make sure that we don't run into a situation that uh, we uh, can't really uh, keep uh, an adequate uh, staffed uh, polling site. Mm, that's an interesting point. Thanks for sharing that, Mark. Anything else, Katie? I think you really hit home a lot of things that we've been getting phone calls at our office with questions about, but I would just encourage everyone if they have a question or if they're needing some assistance while they're filling out their applications, just feel free to reach out. We're here. We're on the phones. 328-7650. You know that number. <laughs> I do. <laughs> okay. And my very last, this is, this is actually a critically important question. I ask this usually in these interviews, and you're, you two are my last one for this Our Town podcast uh, for the time being for the season. Do, what is your favorite taco? Do you like tacos? Tacos are my favorite, and so I have to know what kind of tacos people like. Well, I like, uh, uh, I think it's Jed's tacos they have, but the type, you know, they're in Rochester, but- Oh, I'm maybe familiar. I, I, I shouldn't be endorsing places. somebody, but they're very good. And I love their walleye taco there. That is great. I've not had that one. I'll have to try it out. What about you, Katie? I am a big fan of pork carnitas. Mm. And um, Jefe Rojo, though, has one that's got a fried avocado on it. Big fan. Big fan. That sounds really good. I actually have not had lunch yet, so um, I might just have to go get tacos. <laughs> Well, I appreciate you two being on the show. It was very informative, and I hope it was helpful to our listeners and viewers. Thank you so much for tuning in to Our Town Podcast, a KSMQ public television show. I want to thank Annie for her producing mad skills. She's amazing. She puts a lot of work into this, and the outcome is phenomenal. Thank you so much, Annie. I appreciate you and the pleasure of co-producing this show with you. Leave us a review if you liked what you heard, and subscribe. Catch up with us on Facebook or Twitter at KSMQ. Hashtag our time. Thank you. I'm